So this is a guy, I don't think his biography matters <laughs> too much. He's at one of the big universities in England. He died around the same time this book came out. He was responding to another big time English philosopher at Oxford or Cambridge or one of those named Richard Swinburne. So there's a lot of re references to Richard Swinburne. And I think overall, though he tries to be exhaustive through all these arguments, it's a natural theology approach. I think Mackey is a philosopher of science and an analytic philosopher. So if you thought that analytic philosophy is just Bertram Russell talking about numbers and Frege talking about sets from our past episodes, this is a good example of somebody using just very analytical methods. Let's lay out all the arguments, step one, step two, step three, and trying to be exhaustive in how he's approaching it. That's a good word. So you found the, the experience of reading this a little much? It was exhaustive. <laughs> Exhausting. I found it a bit of a tough read at first. I think it's uh, difficult to get back into uh, cosmological and ontological and all of those things that you kind of have an idea of, but it's getting thrown back into the jargon of philosophy 101. Yeah, well, we name dropped those things a lot, and we thought it was time that we got serious about them. In fact, in the Schleiermacher episode, when I name dropped them, I did it in such a hasty way that somebody accused Wes and me of, of not knowing the difference between the two, of really of not knowing what we were talking about at all. Which was nonsense. But now, for sure, since we've read this, we know hopefully what we're talking about. And I guess the challenge, though, with something this analytical and lengthy, that it just goes on and on about every one of these arguments, is getting enough of the sense of this communicated so we're not violating our ground rule to, oh, just go read the book yourself. You'll get it. We have to get enough substance in there that something is conveyed. Perhaps you should mention what our ground rules are. Well, Robert, our token theist from South Africa, as a result of that same line of uh, criticism to our Schleiermacher, I thought we should get somebody that at least uh, would admit to being theist. <laughs> I remember there's definitely a rule about no name dropping. Okay. Unfortunately, since this is like a secondary work that we're dealing with, there is kind of a lot of name dropping. Yeah, it's going to be hard to stick to that rule. <laughs> it's certainly a rule that Mackie doesn't take too seriously. He name drops all <laughs> over the place. But he cashes out. He says, here's an objection from Newman, or, you know, from whoever. Here's an argument from this guy and this guy. I don't think he just says, and Ichi wouldn't have liked that either, and then moves on, you know. Fair enough. Do you remember anything else? Yeah, we've got to be rigorous and exact in all we say, unless it would be more humorous not to. Well, there you go. And we're going to try to assume that our audience has not read, certainly has not read this book, but does not have a philosophy background. So I think some of the more interesting parts of this Mackey book are the arcana of the ontological and cosmological arguments, talking about necessary beings and, and contingency of the universe and things like that. So we'll try to decode all that enough to follow what we're talking about. Robert, tell the folks a little about why you're here, who you are, about your blog, etc. I uh, am a commenter on the Partially Examined Life blog, and I have my own blog called OutsideOfEden.com, where I cover topics around spirituality, atheism, theism, pop culture, music, and I think I'm evidence that if you comment on other people's blogs, good things happen to you. <laughs> Well, the fact that you are somebody who was evidently sympathetic to theistic positions, but was uh, not mad at us. That was the key. That's a very small <laughs> subset of the population. <laughs> yeah, commenting in and of itself is not a guarantee of good things happening. <laughs> Humorously and constructively. Yeah. <laughs> the comments have to be good comments. Yes. And plus, I went to your blog, and it was good. There were interesting things on it. So Yeah, I, I try to cover, you know, what would be the theology of a Simpsons episode or a Bruce Springsteen song. And while doing that, I, I seem to annoy people on both sides of the spectrum, both atheists and theists. So I consider that probably a sign that I'm doing something right. And I remember when we talked before, you were a bit skeptical about all these proofs yourself, right? Yeah, I think as an outsider, I look at Mackey's work and it seems to be a lot of philosophical self-referencing. Outsiders, I think, especially people who would consider themselves believers or of faith, don't really have any of these arguments as the reason why they believe in God. So it's not as though people were objectively, academically looking at the ontological argument and decided, bang. I better believe in God. And I feel like this work doesn't really address that issue. It seems to assume that most people actually do have a rational reason for believing in God, and they've kind of gone through the philosophical arguments themselves, but they're somehow defective and need to be talked out of them. Or at least he's within an academic tradition and is trying to make some sort of advances in pushing group knowledge forward as opposed to whatever individual idiosyncratic reason that you may have that is entirely private and incommunicable for, for right. believing. 
I think it's a hard one because you do have this weight of tradition, people like Aquinas and Descartes and all their arguments for God, but it's not like you see that in the real world. Outside of the ivory towers of academia, people in church aren't exactly making all of the arguments, although some of them they are. So I think certainly the discussions around morality, what's the source of our sense of right and wrong, is maybe something you might hear in a church, but you're probably unlikely to hear the ontological argument in a church. Yes. Very unlikely. You know, an important question is whether whatever one's motivations for believing in God, whether one can do that rationally. So, for instance, since Kant and Hume, most people have accepted that the arguments for the existence of God fail in some way. And what Mackey here is doing is recounting some of that and refining them a little bit in some cases. But Kant himself thought that despite the fact that those arguments fail, one could still have practical reasons for believing in God and then William James pragmatic reasons, which Mackey touches on briefly. But there's still a case to be made that one can have reasons to believe in God and rationally believe in God, even if one's fundamental motivations are simply faith, are not themselves rational. You know, here's a demonstrative argument, therefore I believe in God. And I think that's what you were getting at, Robert. Yeah, I agree. I think the one area where perhaps people at least seem to think that they have approached it rationally is the argument for design. So you'll, you'll often hear people argue very convincingly that the reason why they believe is because they've looked at the design argument. That and possibly the uh, morality argument are probably Mm -hmm. the two that really extend into popular culture. And ironically, I think the cosmological argument is probably the strongest if you were to rate these arguments. Well, I think the difference between where Kant was historically and where Mackey is coming in is Kant was reacting to a tradition that thought you could prove deductively that God exists, right? With certainty, he's coming out of this Cartesian tradition. And after Kant, so Swinburne, the guy that Mackey is chiefly responding to, does not really try to argue very much deductively. It's all inductive and with a great respect for scientific method. Swinburne thinks that really the idea of a creator god is the simplest possible hypothesis to explain for instance, the wonders of creation that we see around us, the commonality in all things, like explaining why the laws of nature are what they are in the first place. He seems to think that there's something missing if we take a merely scientific, science is great, science's explanations are right. He accepts the theory of evolution, Swinburne does, Mm -hmm. but says, even given all that, there's something unsatisfying. There's something that still needs to be explained. This is a point of disagreement. Mackey is going to come down against him, but this is what he has in mind. So when we hit the cosmological argument, I mean, that's traditionally a deductive argument. You know, if everything for sure has a cause, there must be a first cause. Well, Swinburne has an inductive version of it. It's more likely than not. Right. <laughs> Which is a much more modern, I think that made this book. What I really liked about Mackey is even when he's, you know, he spends a lot of time talking specifically about what Descartes said, what Thomas Aquinas said, but he tries to pull these arguments out of their original settings to some extent, because it's too easy if you're just reading, especially Kant, who's so filled with his own vocabulary to try to pull it out of a Kantian context and see, is there anything, you know, that your man on the street would find valuable about? How can we rephrase, say, one of Descartes' arguments? So it's detached from Descartes' whole project. Like, is it still useful in some other way? Any other initial impressions, or should we just jump to the first one? I think we should jump to the first one. Well, I thought we might want to start with his chapter two. Mackey's chapter one is on Hume's argument against miracles, which we've at least mentioned in our past Hume epistemology episode. But chapter two is when he talks about Descartes' initial argument in his third meditation for the existence of God, which uh, I think longtime listeners, that was our, what, episode number two. And at the time we talked in depth about the first two meditations and then just got to meditation three and said, oh my God, he just has this horrible argument for the existence of God. It's so bad. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. And then dissolved in snickering. And that was kind of the end of it. So I feel like I owe the listeners three years later, whatever it is, some sort of more detailed account. And actually, contra to my memory of this, Descartes is well known for having a version of the ontological argument, which is Anselm's old argument. And he does, but that's in Meditation 5. In Meditation 3 here, the one he actually does. So remember, Descartes has been arguing, he's doubting everything, and he wants to come up with something indubitable that will ground everything else. Well, the fact that he is thinking right now, that's indubitable. And from there, he gets this principle of whatever it is that I clearly and distinctly understand, that seems to be true. In the process of doing this, one of the steps is to show there's, there's a God. Just by examining the contents of his consciousness alone, the contents of his mind, his ideas, 
So in that sense, this first argument is a version of the ontological argument because it's going just from an idea to the being of God. Somebody else want to actually tell how we, we want to read it? Essentially, the argument is that ideas come from somewhere. If you think of a dog, it's because you've seen a dog or even something like a unicorn. You've seen a horn and a horse. So you can put the two together and your ideas are based on a form of reality. But God is not quite as simple as that. You've never seen infinity or perfection in that sense. So it's almost as though God had to put it there. And one of the key pieces is because the idea, it's clearly and distinctly perceived. Correct. So it's not something that he can doubt or his senses might deceive him. He's got a clear perception of it, which counts as an authority for him. Right. For this purpose, it just, you know, we don't have to give a whole definition of God. It's just an infinite being. Having the idea of an infinite being at all, it means that infinity itself is not a report, like you were saying, of something we've seen. He also, I think the other key point is, is that there are two sources that an idea could have. One of them is because we've actually seen or experienced a thing. The other is, well, maybe my own mind just came up with it itself. And he thinks that that might be possible for lots of things. But he, for some reason, even if you think, and again, this is sort of leaving Descartes' project because he hadn't proved the existence of himself as a physical object or his brain or anything like this. But you might say, my brain is a physical object, and that has plenty of causal power to produce any sort of wispy idea that's going to flit across it. But in this case, the idea of infinity, well, my brain is not infinitely large. How could I have this idea of infinity at all, of an infinite being, without it coming from somewhere that's not my brain and not something I've seen, right? Yeah, Mackey, on page 36 and 37, he gives this nice little summary. He's paraphrasing Descartes. I have this remarkable concept of God, of an infinitely powerful and infinitely perfect being, creator and sustainer of the whole universe. The content of this concept cannot have been built up out of other mental contents, nor can it have been derived in any ordinary way from the perception of material things, or from my awareness of myself and of the operations of my mind. It is also quite different from the ideas of the various secondary qualities for which it is possible to suppose that my own mind, in conjunction with my senses, is somehow responsible. From what source, then, can the content of this concept be derived? This must be an extramental entity which actually possesses the features of which this content includes representations. That is to say, an actually existing infinitely perfect being. And by secondary qualities, he's talking about, say, the qualitative feeling of something being read as arising from say, the interaction of different wavelengths of light in our brain. So someone might argue that God is like a secondary quality. and By secondary qualities, like color, Yeah, that maybe a lot of philosophers think there's not color actually in the world. Right. It's just something right. that we're reacting maybe to some interaction with the world, but our mind is making that up. There you go. So God right. is not just made up like a secondary quality based on some interaction between mind and world. And it's important to note that the point of this is to prove the existence of God, not the attributes of the idea. There's an idea of God as being infinite, omnipotent, and so on and, and so forth. And there's a step you have to take where you say that necessary existence is contained in that idea. It's like it's, I don't want to use the term property because that's kind of an, an issue, but necessary existence is a necessary part of the idea of an infinite, omnipotent, omniscient, God that Descartes has. The way you're phrasing it, I think, slides over, shows exactly how close, even though this version in Meditation 3 is not technically the ontological argument, it slides very naturally to his version in uh, number five, which is the updated version of the classic Proof from Saint Anselm. But in this version here, in number three, like it doesn't mention specifically that he has to have a necessary existence. It's just that infinity is mm, so huge, point, somebody right? must have put it there. Yeah, one is making a sort of argument about causes. It's almost like a cross between the cosmological and ontological. You're saying God has to be there as the cause of the concept. Gotcha. Whereas Anselm's argument is more about logical consistency or a sort of analytic derivation from a concept. So the question is kind of, could you have an idea of infinity if there was no such thing? Could you get by just adding numbers together or objects together the idea of infinity or the idea of an absolute omnipotent God, or would the idea require existence? Right. The idea of infinity must be caused by this actually infinite thing. Whereas one might argue, as Mackey does, that in fact we get this concept of, of infinity. It comes from an idea of a limit or something that's progressively increasing something, let's say, towards a limit. Yeah, well, I think Mackey also touches on the idea that this is quite similar to Plato's theory of forms, mm. not to start off by name dropping, but 
the idea of I've never seen a straight line or a perfect circle in the world. My eyes have never seen it. I've only seen approximations of it. But I have a sense that it's real, so it must exist somewhere. And it's essentially a version of this argument that Descartes is using, that I've got this idea that I've never seen, and my ideas come from somewhere, so it must be real. Whereas the response to that is that this form is a negative or limiting notion of a perfectly straight line that you get at by the idea is that, well, ah, this thing is straighter than another. It's not perfectly straight because it's a real thing in the world. But once you have the idea of something being straighter, you can gradually increase that towards a limit and a limiting notion that which nothing is straighter is your form. But it doesn't have to exist because it can just be built up out of your common everyday experience. So you don't buy Plato's response to that, which is, how do we even see that one thing as a progression on another thing without having already in mind this limit to compare it to? How do we know that this line is straighter than that line if we didn't already have the notion of straight, which is really the notion of perfectly straight, which is the notion of an infinite? Yeah, I think that's an argument that Mackey doesn't deal with, right? Not that I notice. He just seems to give the answer that I usually give in these discussions about that, which is, no, I don't actually have a notion of infinity. It's all a negative notion, which is one that Descartes explicitly considers right there. So we're getting to a point, I think this is our first example, where something just seems obvious. Like, it just seems obvious to him. He clearly and distinctly has a positive notion of infinity in his head, and yet others disagree. So (laughs) we're just always going to agree to disagree? Like, what... (laughs) I think the problem is that you can't experience infinity. It's not like you could ever look at a really large pile of coins and say, that's infinity. And uh, I'm not sure how you get outside of Descartes' mind. I don't know how you take that idea out of Descartes' mind and be able to examine it in an objective way. I don't think you can get out of his head. Well, but we all share it. I mean, so Swinburne really thinks infinity is simple. So my references to Swinburne here, the books that Mackey is reacting to are like three different books from 1977 through 81, The Coherence of Theism, The Existence of God, Faith and Reason, mostly those three. The one I have in my hand here is a much shorter version just called Is There a God from 1996. And it is a, he actually talks about Mackey for a second in like the last page saying, look, I know Mackey's already responded to this, but I still think what I'm saying is reasonable. So he doesn't really respond to Mackey. It's just a shortened, easy to read version of it that I skimmed through. So he thinks that infinity is the simplest explanation. Of course, we have a notion of infinity in our heads. It's the very large that is difficult to hold in our heads. Like, you know, a million billion. I don't have that number in my head, but infinity, it's a completely simple, understandable thing. Of course, we aren't experiencing it in the way we're experiencing a single or two or three things in front of us. I think the objection here as well is that just because you can conceive of something doesn't mean it exists. So you can conceive of say, a unicorn. Its existence is not implied by that conception of the unicorn. And I think that's the objection to this argument, that yes, you can conceive of infinity, you can conceive of perception, you can conceive of omnipotence, but that doesn't lead to existence. Well, I think it sounds like all the gravity is pulling us into a consideration of the ontological argument proper. (laughs) So this particular one in Meditation 3 is just about, is the notion of infinity in our heads so huge it must have been caused by an infinite thing? Not just does it prove that an infinite thing exists, because of course, Descartes thinks there are lots of things in our heads, like unicorns, you were saying, that don't exist in real life. It's just that in that case, the amount of reality, he says, that our formal reality that our minds have, has is completely sufficient to give us the objective reality he considers, in other words, the reality of the idea considered as an object in our heads of the notion of a unicorn. But that doesn't work with infinity in this concept. Mark, that's a good point, is that this version of Descartes' argument does rely on his notion of clarity and distinctness of ideas. Because what he's going to say is the clarity and distinctness of the idea of the unicorn, it's lacking something because there are no unicorns you actually ever perceived So Descartes is going to say that your idea of a unicorn is never going to be as clear and distinct as your idea of a horse, and that there's something essential there. But he thinks that his idea of God is as clear and distinct, so to speak, as his idea of a horse or chair or anything like that, which, as you already mentioned, is debatable. (laughs) You can say that. But when Descartes says, by God, I understand a substance, infinite, independent, all-knowing, all-powerful, and by which I myself and every other thing that exists were created. If you could actually clearly and distinctly conceive of such a thing, then you might very well question 
how it got into your head, <laughs> which is exactly mm -hmm. what he does. But the first objection is you probably don't have as clear and distinct an idea as you think you do. And then the second objection is to take on the notion of causality, right? Because that's really what it hinges on is it says, okay, if you do have this clear and distinct idea and ideas are always generated from somewhere and you could not have generated that idea yourself from your experience or what have you, then something else must have generated and stuck it in your brain. Yep. And that thing is God. And I think it's that last point, which is Mackie's objection, that ideas don't necessarily have to come from perception, that you can experience it as a negative. You're aware of your own limitations and imperfections, so therefore you can conceive of perfection, even though you would never attain perfection. Yes. What I find interesting here, before we jump to the ontological argument proper, is that both Mackie and Descartes here, they agree that we do have this idea in our head. That is, the idea of an infinite being is coherent. And that's just an initial line that you could object to before any of this gets off the ground. And actually reading the Swinburne, I think it was a little persuasive to me in talking me out of this. So there are two kinds of theologians that one, one might be in the tradition of Aquinas and Descartes and these guys who really think that the fundamental notions are reasonable and understandable. Now, of course, we don't know what it's like to be an infinite being because we're not. But we can understand that. That's a perfectly simple notion. And then there's this version that's come up in like our Taoism discussion and our, our Schleiermacher discussion that the infinite is so huge that we don't have it in our head. We could never even really conceive of it. There's nothing we can say about God. It's all going to fall into apparent self-contradiction, but it's, it's a pregnant self-contradiction. You know, what is truly important can't be said. It's not something that reason can get a hold of. So I think about those medieval dilemmas like, can God create a rock bigger than he can lift? That uh, you might just say that's like a Zen koan, that you just contemplate the divine and say, ultimately, it's beyond human understanding and we shouldn't be making these rational arguments in the first place. But this is the other tradition. This is natural theology. So Swinburne just says, no. God can't make a rock bigger than he can lift. And that doesn't mean he's not omnipotent, but omnipotent is being able to do everything that there is to do. If something violates the law of logic, it is not a valid option for anyone to do, no matter how powerful they are. So uh, Swinburne himself, I don't want to go into the details on this, but he has to make some tough decisions, I think, and depart from maybe what your average theist would believe, even though he's a Catholic and trying to sort of represent the Thomas Aquinas traditional position. Like he thinks that the notion of God outside of time doesn't make any sense to him. If God's an object, God exists in time. Well, God's a special kind of object that exists at all places and was present from all times, but he doesn't exist outside of the stream of time. And so in the same way that you can't do everything, like to violate the laws of logic, God can't know, for instance, the future actions of free people because he gave us freedom. We exist in time. He exists in time, even though all of the time, he's not above time looking upon our future. So that's another sort of traditional paradox. How can we be free yet God knows what we're going to do? Well, according to Swinburne, who's trying his best to make this all rational, God doesn't know what we're going to do. I think that that's why Mackey doesn't consider this objection at all. There should be a whole chapter on it as far as I'm concerned, that the notion of God is just internally incoherent. But he's starting with Swinburne's notion, I think, which I... I is something like, I don't know, maybe Descartes or uh, Aquinas hadn't thought it out completely, but they're definitely pushing on the same purely rationalist, understandable notion of God. Can I make a reference to an earlier episode? I've done it five times already. So, <laughs> so when we were did the philosophy of mind episode, we read Nagel's article, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Yeah. Yep. And the conclusion is we don't know what it's like to be a bat, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find interesting is this bit about, well, I have this clear and distinct idea of God. And this clear and distinct idea of God is not just the infinite, right? It's omnipotent, omniscient, infinite. Perfectly good. You know, self-generating, self-generating, all these things. If I can't even have a concept, and maybe I'm making a, an error here, but if I have, don't even know what it's like to be a bat, how could I possibly have any idea of what it's like to be God? And therefore, how could my idea of God be anything more than the kind of idea I have of a bat? It's furry, it falls in this phylum, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. In which case, it's not a very rich idea. Well, you're not asking what it's like to be God, though. You are just asking about the God equivalence of Furry and all that. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the content of that idea is not robust enough to warrant needing a source outside of myself. Yeah, well, I think the clear and distinct thing really gets us into the 
on a logical arguments because the work it's doing there for Descartes is that it's sort of conceptual or analytic, right? In the same way that the idea of a mountain can't be separated from that of a valley, you can't separate the idea of God from that of God's existence. So the clearness and distinctness there is meant to get you towards this comparison of, say, idea of God with mathematical ideas where it's very, very clear that one thing follows analytically or definitionally from another. And so the idea here is that it should be very clear that God's existence follows almost definitionally from his concepts. I mean, I agree with you that is it really a clear and distinct idea? Not in any robust sense, right? I I just think if you say, oh, well, God is all-knowing, that's almost very obscure. It's almost meaningless, yeah. 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 I would hardly call it clear and distinct Yeah, to the extent you would need to have somebody implanted in your brain. Right. So somebody want to give a version, maybe Descartes' version of the Meditation 5 ontological argument proper with perfections? I might have done that earlier, but here's this. I have an idea of a supremely perfect being, i.e. a being having all perfections. Necessary existence is a perfection. Therefore, a supremely perfect being exists. How's that? Yep. Yeah. Short and sweet. Thank you, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. (laughs) So we'd responded to this on some episodes before with like Kant's version with, oh, you can't say that uh, existence is one of the perfections because even if a perfection means every attribute that is perfect, something has every good attribute, but existing is not an attribute at all. It's not a property. It's something that it does. uh, That seems to be the way Kant put it. And so that got codified in formal logic with the quantifiers and uh, in our... Frege episode, Frege or and or our Russell episodes, we talked about how you just don't even give it the same symbology. So if you say X is green, you might say G X, where G is is green, but you can't make existence a predicate like that. You have to use a quantifier and say there is such an X, such that X has this property, and there is such a is just a completely different thing logically than these other things. Yeah, and Mackey will sidestep that and make us agnostics on whether existence can be a property because he thinks that there's a more fundamental objection. And I like that. Mackey will open up the possibility of saying there exists an X such that X is G and X exists. But then you have to think about the relationship between your two different uses there of X exists, where you're using exists as a predicate, and then this quantifying, this existential quantifier, there exists an X such that. I think we should use the example of the re-Martian here that Mackie uses. What page is that on? So page 41 at the top. Mackie uses the example of saying that a Martian exists is different from saying something like a re-Martian exists, where re-Martian is defined as a Martian who exists. So existence is contained in the definition. Then from that, you say it's illogical to say a re-Martian does not exist. It's self-contradictory. And this is the kind of argument that Descartes is making. He's begged the question by saying God exists. And so therefore he proves a logical contradiction to say God does yeah. not exist. And th- this is Kant's argument against which Mackey is going to say, we don't need to accept this. So for Kant, Kant is just going to come out with existence can't be a predicate. Yeah, you can't have remartian. You can't have a remartian. And that's a kind of vague and unsupported. That's a question that's complex enough that Mackey doesn't want to get into it. He wants to leave that open, the idea of whether existence can be a predicate. So by the time Mackey is done with this, you can have a concept of remartian, but you can coherently say it is not the case that there exists an X such that X is a remartian, which breaks down to, you can say it is not the case there exists an X such that X is a Martian and X exists. In other words, you can treat existence as a predicate and then deny that something exists with that predicate. Right. Deny that it is instantiated. And it's exactly. Right. So that's what Maggie doesn't say. There are two senses of existence. He just says, fine, let's let existence be a predicate and say, you can define any new concept with existence in it. I don't mean Santa Claus. I mean the existent Santa Claus that I'll call Schmanta Claus. You know, you can right. make up any concept like that. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that. What would? There's no limits like that on how concepts can work. But the question is, no matter what kind of concept you come up with, is it instantiated? Is there some object in the world that corresponds to that or not? Right. The idea of its existing does not automatically guarantee its existence or its instantiation. And it's perfectly fine to have a concept where the idea of its existing is built into that concept. But then again, you can coherently deny that such a thing is instantiated or such a thing exists. Yeah, It's almost like the problem of studying economics that... You can build a system that is logically consistent from start to finish, 
and say A, therefore B, and it's all completely logically consistent, but it doesn't mean that it'll actually apply in the real world. Um, <laughs> right. Same problem here. Or Freud's whole psychological, you can make this internally consistent system. That's a name drop. You can listen. <laughs> <laughs> so we can make all these claims about how a re-martian has the concept of existence built into its definition. It's logically consistent to say a re-martian exists, but it doesn't mean that in reality, in itself, there is such a thing as a re-martian that you could touch. That's the problem. The objection is obvious, like that things that are in your head should not... <laughs> The contents of your ideas should not indicate the contents of what's outside of your mind. But I mean, that's the, the, everybody listen, people are, have not taken many philosophy classes or don't have the patience <laughs> who are listening to this are just like, why are you dwelling on this? This is so obviously stupid. But saying exactly what is wrong with it. It sounds so in our Schopenhauer episode, Schopenhauer just said there are different realms that the principle of sufficient reason applies. And what that means exactly here doesn't matter so much. But just the fact that the kinds of explanations you give for what goes on in the sequence of ideas in your head is different than the kind of explanations that you give to the sequence of what goes on in the world. And there's no those don't connect in such a way that anything that's in your head should indicate that anything outside what's in the world. And so the question is, is that just a way of capturing? a well-understood fact, or is it just solving the matter by fiat? It sounds like that Kant or Frege creating this notation that just says, look, existence isn't a predicate. I've written it as a quantifier. It's not a predicate. That sounds like you're solving it by definition, that you're not really engaging. It's Schopenhauer's move, which I think reflects our common sense reply to this. Is that sufficient? Or have we hit another point that, oh, well, that it seems reasonable to me that those things wouldn't interact. Oh, but it seems reasonable to me that they would. And we must agree to disagree. And there's something unanalyzable about what seems reasonable to us. That's what so much of this argument of any of these arguments come down to. I think the problem is that um, it's sort of, again, the radical Cartesian doubt that once you start to doubt everything outside of your experience, you can't actually reason your way out of your mind. I mean, Descartes argued that you could, but you actually can't reason from your own perception out to reality. There is no escape from radical doubt. I think that's essentially what Mackie dismisses all of these arguments as. Once you doubt your experiences, it's almost impossible to get back to the reality outside of your head. However well you think you can conceive of something, you'll never get to existence out of that. Mm. So you think that Mackie thinks that of all of the ontological proofs, including Anselm's? Yeah. I think Anselm is just a version of this. Which would be a way of saying there's no way to get to existence from concepts. You don't even need to go the radical doubt route. If your goal is to try to prove the existence of God from a concept through reason, quote unquote, pure reason, whatever, you'll just never get there because there's something fundamentally disconnected between concepts of things and the existence of things. Yeah, or as Mackey puts it, we must still go outside of the concept in order to ascribe existence to the object, even if the concept contains the idea of existence. <laughs> yeah, as, as paradoxical as that sounds. And I think it's easier to see that, you're right, Robert, in Descartes' thing, he's specifically in Cartesian doubt, he's doubted everything, how is he going to get outside that? In Anselm's, well, it's put a little differently, it's more considering the concept itself. Maybe this is a difference that's not a difference, I'm not, I'm not sure yet. But it's considering God as, let's define him as a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. And so if you have in your head, the fool, he says, has this idea, he accepts the definition of God as a being which nothing greater can be conceived, but also thinks that this does not exist. And someone would say to the fool, right, you've got this idea in your mind of something that there is nothing greater than that idea in your mind. And then the immediate follow up is, you know, once the fool agrees to that point, he's sort of in the trap. And Anselm says, right, well, wouldn't a God who actually exists be greater than the idea in your own mind? Therefore, God exists. Yeah. So how is that? Have we already given the response? How, what additional response is needed to that version over what we've already said? Well, it's the remarsion thing uh, over again. The fool's judgment that this concept is not realized does not commit him into reading non-existence back into the content of that concept, which is what he would need to involve him in, in incoherence. You can allow existence as a predicate, and you can allow a concept to rope existence in, and then you are committed to, it is incoherent to say, for instance, the remartian doesn't exist, which when you parse it out logically is, would be there exists an X such that X is a remartian, and X does not exist. That's incoherent. But that yeah. doesn't rope you into, it is not the case 
that no read Martians exist. It is not the case that there exists an X such that X is a Remartian. That is not inconsistent with the Remartian with the predicate of existence. I mean, it gets logically thorny there, but if you... So basically, the idea is that there's no incoherence. There's no incoherence in both allowing that that which nothing greater can be seen must have the predicate of existence, okay, but then also allowing that it's not instantiated, that one must right. always go outside of the concept for instantiation and with I, the I think there's existential an ob- quantifier. I think there's an objection that Mackey raises, which is, I think, based on a monk whose name is escaping me now, who says you could apply the same reasoning to this concept of a perfect island. So you could say, I've got this concept in my mind of a perfect island. Well, wouldn't a perfect island that's actually out there be better than my concept? Therefore, the perfect island exists. (laughs) But Anton responds to that. Yeah, he says that there's something a dissimilarity between the perfect island concept and the perfect God concept. Well, well his yeah. argument would be that God is greater than this perfect island. So the perfect island isn't the most awesome thing ever conceived. So that means the perfect island doesn't have to exist. But Correct. But comparing the different perfect islands, the existent one and the non-existent one, it still seems like it should work. Even, mm. even if there's a, a non-island altogether that's more perfect, if it worked at all... <laughs> This is all gets addressed, by the way, on page 52. As soon as Anselm's proof became known, it was criticized by Guanilo, writing on behalf of the fool. It says, if Anselm's proof is valid, we could equally validly prove the existence somewhere in the ocean of the imaginary lost island that surpasses in its attractions all inhabited countries. For actually existing is an essential element in such superiority. I guess he tried to tap into the same greater than part of the idea. So in this case, what Ganilo is saying is, well, I have an idea of an island than which nothing greater can be conceived. Therefore, that island must exist. And Anselm has to go back and say there's a difference between... Well, it surpasses in its attractions all inhabited countries. Right. So it's a specific kind of perfection. A specific kind of perfection. Yeah. Right. And Anselm's response is that, and I'm looking at 53, the same page that you were just talking about, so it's the very bottom paragraph that Mackey begins to describe it. But going on to 54, his reply to the Lost Island argument is that, whereas that island can be conceived not to exist, God, or being in which nothing greater can be conceived, cannot. And this would be a good reply, pointing to a real distinction, if Anselm were right in saying it is possible to conceive of a being which cannot be conceived not to exist. In other words, the island depends on one perfection. It's about the attractions, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas God, we're talking about all perfections, all realities, and then which requires existence. Yeah, I mean, I don't find the Lost Island objection particularly convincing. Structurally, the argument has the same. You might say that the argument is logically sound, but not valid. Is that the right... I'm afraid to talk about logic after I spoke up those posts <laughs> so many years ago, uh, last year. But um, having perfection in attractions and, let's say, natural features, you know, like waterfalls and lakes and mountains and such, is not the same thing as having perfect being in the sense that St. Anselm is talking about God. So I don't find that a particularly convincing objection myself. Not that I believe in Sam's proof, but I just don't think that's a very robust objection. I think where Mackey talks about how Anselm is just subject to the same thing as Descartes, and he does that at the beginning of 52. He just says there's a close analogy between Anselm's and Descartes, and a correspondingly between the vital criticism. If you have an X explicitly or implicitly includes existence, then you are begging the question. Yeah, essentially all of the ontological proofs are a form of disguising existence within the definition of God. Yes. Which is invalid. I don't think that's it. You can say it's begging the question, but that's like saying analyzing the concept of a circle and coming up with, it's an analytic derivation. So what you do is you start out with a concept and then you analyze the concept. So yes, it's analytic. Yes, it's a priori. And existence should fall out simply out of the concept. That doesn't imply begging the question as long as you you agree on the concept. Critically, you have to agree to the idea that God has all perfections. And then you have to agree to the idea that existence is one of these perfections. There's some critical conceptual premises there. But once you've done that, you can go validly from God is that which is nothing greater can be conceived to the concept of God necessarily contains the predicate of existence. That's fine. But that doesn't get you to instantiation or to actual existence. And that's the critical part. You can't get off the piece of paper, basically. Yeah. (laughs) You can get existence. That's very good. You can get existence on paper. But yeah, you can't go farther than that. When you started talking about him being a necessary being, that if God exists, that he has to exist. I mean, that seems like 
if God exists at all, then it couldn't have been just an accident that God exists. Like either God is the fundamental cause of all the universe and the thing underlying it, or he's not. It's not that, well, he is, but he might not have been. Right. So, so one of the variations off this, which just I only want to bring up because it's a contemporary line and it brought me back to our Jesus. symbolic logic course. Modal logic. Modal logic, yes, which is just to say – if you're saying that something necessarily exists, the way you interpret that in modal logic is it exists in all possible worlds. Worst development in the history of philosophy. <laughs> well, and, and you could even take this example as a, well, as a demonstration of how goofy it is or how complicated it has to get for it to make any sense because... Planting a... Planting a... Yeah. Yeah. So he's one of the names that comes up in terms of like the guys arguing against the new atheists. Planting a is still active today. I'm sorry, can I just read this? Well, go ahead and set your preface. And actually, Mackie throws out a little barb again, you know. I know, I love it. That's oh, what yeah, I want so to read. you're going to read? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Plantingo is, is, is a fairly famous philosopher and well-respected and I guess helped to develop. Is that right? Or is he just did he just use... No, he's just using... Logic? He's just using, using modal logic. Yeah. So planning and put forward a proof using modal logic. But I, I just want to read this paragraph from Mackey. It says, Some knowledge of planning as argument and the general suggestion that modal logic may rescue philosophical theology from the criticisms of Hume and Kant and their empiricist or positivist successors has begun to leak out <laughs> from purely philosophical discussions and to receive wider publicity. So perhaps St. Alvin, <laughs> that's Plantinga's first name, will eventually take his place beside St. Anselm. At least he should have no difficulty in meeting the miracle working requirement for canonization after the success <laughs> that he has achieved in subverting, as Hume would say, all the principles of the understanding of so many intelligent readers. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> Smackdown. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So the quick version of his argument is just, if God exists, then he necessarily exists. And it's possible that God exists. So to translate that in modal logic terms, right, as far as we know, God could exist or could not exist. So that means it's possible God exists. That means God does exist in at least one possible world, right? Maybe not right. this one. We don't know. But that means he necessarily exists in that possible world. Exactly. Which means he necessarily exists in all possible worlds. <laughs> Including this one. So, Yeah. <laughs> But that, it. it is a misuse of modal logic because <laughs> it relies on this idea of world index properties. Should we try and explain this? Do we want to get into no. this? No. Okay. No. no. <laughs> There's a version of this that's listed on the Stanford site that might we might be able to say it without yeah. getting into all the nonsense. Yeah, that's good. The trick is, you say, it's possible that God exists. That seems like uncontroversial claim. It's possible that God exists. Of course, it's possible, right? But then what you do is you say, well, but God is a necessary being. So whatever properties God has, they are necessary properties. So if it's possible that God exists, then it has to be necessity because God doesn't do anything contingently. God is only necessary. So if you admit possibility, then you're essentially opening the door to the necessity of God's existence. Which is um, quite a leap. Yes. Well, and it was explained to us in the logic class that at least Wes and I had together that you can see how this doesn't work because it should also work the opposite way. It's possible God doesn't exist. And it seems right. like if God doesn't exist, he necessarily doesn't exist. So well, plan <laughs> therefore, and plan planting uh, that brings that up as well right. to his credit, as Mackie says. So. Yes, he merely thinks it's more reasonable. So right. one of those things has to be true. One of the arguments has to go forward. And he thinks inductively a reasonable person would lean in favor of the positive one. And I don't know if I remember why he says that. Mackie doesn't agree. He thinks there's absolutely no way of deciding between the two, right? So it says the premise that it is just possible that there should be something unsurpassably great looks innocent. We are usually ready enough to concede that something, however extravagant, is possible and to confine our critical scrutiny to the question of whether or not it is not merely possible but actual. But unsurpassable greatness, essentially given the necessary nature of God, is a Trojan horse not an innocent little possibility. So Mackie's pointing out that what you're actually talking about when you're talking about possibility is possibility versus actuality and not possibility versus necessity, or there's whatever is even possibly necessary is necessary. It's uh, like he says, a Trojan horse, that what you really want to know is if you say it's possible that God exists and it's possible that God doesn't exist, what you really want to know is whether or not God exists. Right. You're not getting at what properties would follow from him existing or would follow from him as not existing. And one of those backtracking and begging the question. In any case, if you were to 
go back to what Robert was talking about at the beginning of the episode, people who have faith are actually <laughs> worried about the existence of God. This is not going to help them. <laughs> Nobody out there who's looking for a rational defense or a rational proof of the existence of God is going to go to Plantinga and possible world semantics. It's not going to happen. You'd be much better off sticking with Anselm. Let me add to that. Swinburne's, I'm quoting from the very end of his book, which is an epilogue called So What? <laughs> this is after he's gone through a lot of these arguments. He says he's well aware of objections that others have to these arguments. Some of these objections have been around for many centuries. And then he refers to Mackey's as a modern version of these. I'm also aware of counter objections, which can be advanced in turn against every objection to my views and also the need for qualification and amplification of most of the assertions in this book. Argument and counter argument, qualification and amplification can go on forever. But religion is not exceptional in this respect. With respect to any subject, whatever, the discussion can go on forever. But life is short, and we have to act on the basis of what such evidence as we have had time to investigate shows on balance to be probably true. And he gives a lot of examples of that kind of stuff. So even someone who is a hardcore rationalist, the way Swinburne is, is going to say, look, you can keep going back and forth, and just it comes down to some kind of judgment call by intelligent people. <laughs> um. <sighs> My favorite kind of topic.